Charlie Kaywood is a multi-instrumentalist from London who is a member of the band Knife World and has released a solo album called The Divine Abstract. Charlie, thank you so much for joining. Real pleasure, Anthony. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. So uh, tell us a little about yourself and tell us about your album, The Divine Abstract. Well, I've been playing music since I was about 11. Um, I you know, just started getting, getting to playing guitar, learning, like studying classical guitar and electric guitar at the same time. Um, listening to mainly rock music, uh, I suppose, and then kind of very kind of gradually started getting into Indian classical music, um, some Spanish music, and get, uh, sort of wanted to get an active involvement in these types of music. So I started studying sitar when I was about sort of 13 years old. Um, and sort of continued from there, and then later on got into sort of Asia, other Asian music, so uh, Japanese music, Chinese music, and then sort of started picking things up along the way, and um, then eventually went on to studying sort of seriously in like uh, London Centre of Contemporary Music, and then later SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and so so I was kind of studying at the same time. Um, you know, Western popular music, jazz, classical, you know, rock, blues, all of all the, st the stuff you learn in music college, but at the same time had this real kind of serious interest in other types of music and wanted to have some kind of art active participation in it. So, so I learned about, say, Balinese Gamelan when I was at Selwes, and then straight away when I graduated, started going to sessions and learning about it and playing it. And I've been doing that for six years now. And, and also I was lucky enough when I was studying to be taught things like orchestration and sort of arrangement and all of these more sort of elaborate things that you don't get taught in many places. And, and then gradually started kind of getting interested in other music, like sort of lots of contemporary classical music, like you know, Steve Reich and Igor Stravinsky and uh, particularly Min Minimalists and Olivia Messiaen and all, all. And so I was kind of... <laughs> influenced by lots of different types of music from everywhere and like originally the sort of music I was listening to in, on the sort of the rock side of things was fairly ordinary you know you kind of your Iron Maidens and sort of bad religions and stuff like that and, you know I was still re you know, into it but then sort of in my late teens sort of started hearing more things like you know Frank Zappa, Miles Davis, um, Cardiacs were a particular sort of revelatory experience for me um, and I got to see their last ever London show back in 2007, which was quite a sort of, sort of a moment of epiphany. And, and the Divine Abstract sort of, I didn't actually know it was going to be an album until half of it was already written, because it was it was part of that process of sort of becoming sort of immersed in other types of music and sort of having interests in all sort of different types of music. I didn't really see any sort of uh, disconnection between them and so I was, I was writing sort of pieces which had sort of elements of Indian classical music and had elements of um, sort of contemporary classical and I was kind of trying to get you know Chinese elements in there and the sort of cyclicity of Balinese gamelan and then about halfway through writing all the pieces I realized oh actually these actually these kind of are turning they've got they've got a sort of shape to them but, but yeah the the album didn't really I didn't think of it as being an album until halfway through, like half the pieces were written um, and they're all written for different reasons. Some of them were while they were studying, some of them were sort of informal commissions from people, but actually one of them was written, Garden of the Mind, which is in the sort of the middle of the album, was written for an ensemble in the States um, who never ended up playing it because it was too difficult. And, and then, um, because actually Carvis from Knife World heard the demo of that and said, well, you know, this, this, sounds like a thing you should put it out when it's done you know and then I was that was the sort of point where I realized oh actually that all along I've been sort of writing this it's got a shape to it there's a kind of arc running through these kind of pieces and um and then so I started writing stuff that would become the, sort of the later part of the album so things like the 30 second path and and um I always knew it was kind of going to be this quite ambitious project to put together. It was going to necessitate lots of different instruments. It was going to 
kind of draw upon lots of different things. And I wasn't quite sure for a long time how well all these tunes would actually sit together as an album. Would it really work? And um, I turned freelance about seven years ago um, and started playing in all kinds of different projects and working as a sort of full-time musician and teaching and all of this stuff. So I was playing in Knife World from about 2012 and working with them quite extensively and also working in other bands like say Tonochrome started around that time and uh, playing in an art rock band called Spiritu with which had Bob Leith and Cardiacs on drums I was play, playing all these different things and sort of being fairly young and in this state of kind of working on lots of things at once it's always your own project that gets kind of put to the side and I always knew it's going to be quite a difficult thing to kind of orchestrate and sort of finish off and um, I did actually start sort of rehearsing bits of it and sort of making, you know, tentative recordings about four years ago. And um, you know, had sort of made a sort of concerted effort to try and get the thing done. Um, but that then I sort of kind of getting, in, get to, getting into the kind of um, sort of state of depression more and more. That's when that kind of period started, sort of around then. Um, and also around that time, I started touring with the Medieval Babes as well, who I'm a multi-instrumentalist for. Um, and so, again, it was another thing that kind of I put on the back burner for a while because I was just working on so much. And then it was kind of around sort of late 2016, I sort of, sort of had a fairly low period, which I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, and I just sort of knew that you know, this had to be done. And so, so I started... Um, finishing off and orchestrating the, the the last two or three tunes on the album, and um, got in contact with my friend Amir Shawat, who's a really good um, engineer and producer who I've worked with before in London, and sort of got together with him with all the demos and everything that's been recorded so far. And I was like, okay, well, this is this is the thing, and yeah, it was with his sort of advice and help and support, I was able to sort of actually think of how to approach this because it, I knew it would necessitate loads of different instrumentalists and it was quite, I knew it was always going to be quite difficult music to kind of put together and sort of edit and kind of mix and because, because the original demos didn't really sound that cohesive as a, as a kind of thing. It, we sort of sat and was like, okay, well, these it sounds like these could be from different places. So that was one thing we had to be sort of be careful of, is making sure that they all sounded like they all flowed and they all sounded like from one place. And um, yeah, it was the, for the remaining sort of few months. I managed to call up a kind of load, loads of sort of musician friends who'd be up for playing it, playing on it, and um, sort of contributing. And in the kind of time of me being a sort of freelancer in London. I'd kind of been lucky enough to meet all these different people who ended up on the record and some of whom I didn't know when I first started writing it. So it's almost as if it needed that time to kind of gestate and kind of slowly develop because some of the musicians who made some of the most important contributions on the album I didn't meet until a couple of years ago and it just seemed kind of right to have them on there and and um, it, it kind of all worked out for the best really. And yeah, the whole thing of doing it, because it was quite an intense period having to kind of record everything and then do all the editing and everything myself. And it was the two of us mixing it. Um, it was quite an intense, but it felt like I was doing the right thing. I was fi f finally focused on something that I should be focusing on. And um, yeah, it was such a relief to kind of finally sort of have it done and have this and look because the very last tune on the album because most of the tunes are fairly sequential but the the it's almost in sort of consecutive order from how the um, when they were written so the first tune on the album is the earliest one and the very last tune on the album I didn't finish writing until about a year ago so it was this kind of big sort of seven year arc that covered the whole kind of writing process but which happens to be in the sort of play out in the sort of 45 minutes. So it's it's, it's like it sort of, um, sort of covers quite an expanse of kind of life, as it were. That's actually something I really love about the album. It is such a rich and layered album with so many different textures and sounds. Uh, can you talk a little about 
the instrumentation, how many different instruments are on the album and how many of them do you play yourself? <laughs> because for people who may not know who you are, yeah. you you are a bit of an enthusiast. <laughs> yeah. Um I didn't in terms of what I play personally on the, on the album, I didn't necessarily want myself to be the focus instrumentally. So obviously I'm playing acoustic guitar and classical guitar and bass. Um but a lot of the sort of the melodic, melodic focus is taken up by the instruments I orchestrated for, like say the woodwinds and the strings and the pitch percussion and pianos and Chinese instruments and things. Mainly because I, I kind of like music that's um, texturally rich. I, I'm, you know, I mean, I've been a guitar player since I was eleven, but and I've been through the whole period of wanting to hear lots of guitar music. But there was kind of a point where I wanted to hear music which had lots of different sort of textures and lots of different sounds and instrumentation, not necessarily needing the guitar to be a foc focal point. And that's kind of what I wanted to get in my own music as well. Like I wanted to have all these guitar parts that the tune, uh, uh, kind of the um, uh, the sort of the skeleton of the tune, the the I, you know because the tunes were written on guitar and then later orchestrated, but I didn't necessarily want it to be the focus all the time. So so I played all the guitar parts, but I also played um, sitar, Indian sitar, on the very first track, and um, on several of the other pieces I play Chinese pipa, which is this sort of pear shaped loop thing that you'd see behind me there. Um, and apart from that, I didn't want to sort of shoehorn in any of the other instruments I play onto the album because there, there are there's a lot to choose from. But I didn't necessarily want to try and get them all on there. It seemed it'd be sort of unnecessary and sort of inappropriate to do that. Um, so that's why there are twenty other musicians on the album. Um, so I, I I couldn't tell you how many instruments there are in total, but there's a, a fair amount. A few and dozen, probably. Probably, yeah, because um, several of those instrumentalists double, doubled up, like um. Uh, Lucy Treacher, who played on the Thirty Second Path, she she layered all the sort of the gamelan instruments that are on there. But there's about eight to ten different gamelan instruments on there that she did in the course of one day. We just sort of multi-tracked them and sort of I took them away and edited them later. Um, so there's all kinds of things on there, but that's yeah, that's kind of what I like. One of the things that I love about these instruments is sometimes it's even hard to tell if it's a vocal part or a woodwind, you know, if, if it's a human, uh, you know, human created sound, sometimes it sounds like keyboards, but I'm pretty sure you don't have any keyboards on the album. Only piano. Right. Uh, like no, no synthesizers piano. or electronic there, there instruments. Some, there, there's some mini Moog on one track. Okay. And the, um, and on that and on the on the thirty second path and on that the the piano and Celeste uh, samples, but they're still samples in an acoustic instrument. So there's no like synth pads or anything like that, and there's no MIDI at all. the challenges of even engineering a record where I mean I wouldn't know where to put a microphone on half of the instruments that, <laughs> that you're recording so what was that experience like? Well, yeah, not, neither would I so that's why well, I was so lucky to have my friend Amir working with me because he's a real genius for recording acoustic sounds I and mean, he's involved in lots of electroacoustic music and sort of experimental music and he does live sound but yeah, he's got this incredibly meticulous approach to like we'd have an instrumentalist come and sort of sit with their instrument and he'd sort of get them to play and sort of stalk around them sort of finding sort of the sweet spot where okay this is where this is where we're gonna put a mic and then so we'll, maybe we'll just have one mic but in a very in a very sort of sweet location 
and but and for some of them we might sort of double up and but he knows exactly what sort of microphones to use so that's it's mainly working with an engineer like that is who with that kind of attention to detail almost obsessive attention to detail when recording acoustic sounds otherwise it it would, wouldn't have nearly it would have been possible otherwise and it wouldn't have sounded as rich as it does um it's interesting what you said about how it um, how some of the melodic instruments almost sound like vocals because um, even though it's fairly strange music and it's very dense music um, I wanted all along for it to have a very strong melodic focus because I, cause, you know, I like melody I also I wanted this music to be able to tell its own narrative without the need for lyrics or voice and I, I think you, it's totally possible to do that over the course of the album, just using sort of instrumental music. Um, I've, so I, Jim, I love vocal music, but I find it more in, universal in a way. It kind of gets to a deeper state, I think, some instrumental music. Um, but in terms of how I approach the recording of many of the instruments, um, it often be through collaboration. So. I'd get them to do a few takes of just playing the part straight, so it's all orchestrated, so it all exists in notation, the reading. Um, so once we're happy with the part, i uh, then get them to sort of phrase it however they want. Like say, so a really good example of that is on Garden of the Mind, there's um, some brilliant clarinet playing by my friend Nicky Marr, um, who I used to play with in a band called Opaz, which was a sort of Turkish gypsy sort of um, band with elements of Arabic and Kurdish and other other things, and I used to play in a band with her doing that kind of repertoire, and and so and she she also plays G clarinet, which is much deeper and kind of well, she doesn't play on the play it on the album, but it informs her phrasing, doing all these kind of melismas and sort of quarter tones and this very sort of colourful sort of decorative kind of playing. It's really expressive. And so I recorded her just doing the part straight, just to have it sort of safe. And then just said, okay, now play it however, however way, however you want it. Just make it sound Turkish, or make do it, play it the way that you would play it. And then she played all these brilliant. It's the same notes, but she played it in her way. And then just like, okay, every time I listened to that tune, I was like, okay, there's Nikki, because it's it's just her characteristic. And um, and there are other instruments I chose specifically for their kind of um, richness in sort of colour. Like say on the three tracks um, that comprise the Earth Dragon sort of set, um, there's a Chinese instrument on there called an Erhu, which is like a two string kind of spike fiddle. It's a really simple instrument. And, um, but what it can do is it can sound incredibly kind of emotional and kind of um, expressive because of all these different ornaments that it can do. And, um, Again, that was another instrument I was really lucky to get because there are barely any sort of professional players of that in London. Um, at least not many who would be able to play stuff as kind of rhythmically challenging and sort of kind of elaborate as those tunes are. And I managed to find um, this player Wang Xiao who played on the album, and then and um, you know basically just told her, you know, these are the notes, but do what you want with it, make it sound like your instrument, and then. Just in like a couple of takes, just straight, and it sounded that there's like finally that's exactly how. It was the first time I'd heard in in the sort of seven years since I sort of originally composed the piece. It was the first time I'd heard that part being played the way I imagined it by an actual who player playing it with all those kind of all that kind of phrasing and sort of delicacy of kind of um, sort of ornamentation and color and everything. It was wonderful. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, that was a big part of it. But yeah, um, but having Amir being able to record acoustic instruments so well was was essential. Yeah, and and um, the other thing was trying to make it all balance as well. That was the that was the um, challenge for later on was editing it all and sort of tr trying to make all the instruments sit together. And because they're all recorded instrumental, oh sorry, individually. There's no. Uh, ensemble playing on the album, even though it sounds like it. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of hours of um, editing and comping and and mixing to make it sound um, approachable. And having Amir there as my sort of other pair of ears 
you know, he would he would say, okay, this doesn't this doesn't make any sense here. I'm not quite sure what this part is meant to do. And so he would always be if it made sense to him, then I know it's working. If it um, if everything's kind of balanced correctly and sort of not sounding like too 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 sort of dense, like kind of like this, too obscuring everything, because it's so sort of densely orchestrated music it, it could easily sound like a mess so having that having him there and sort of trying to make sense of it all was that was essential really i have to say it is a real work of art it is not just a simple album um now i don't have ears attuned to all the various dialects of music particularly across Asia, um, where a lot of your influences seem to come, but to my Western ear, I, I just what thought about, well, between my Western ears and my own sensibilities as a person who makes music, just thinking like you had to learn about all of these instruments, you had to learn how they sound and how they function. You had to learn how to, um, orchestrate music to use those instruments and make an arrangement you had to notate it so that you could have 20 different people playing on it i mean what what an extraordinary work of art um it's a lot of people it's not like normal classical music where you can just hire this ensemble i mean you're pulling influences from so many different areas even if you went to India or went to China or Japan or something, you wouldn't be able to find the ensemble to play it. <laughs> it's such a homogenization of of musical culture and sounds. So it it's a real work of art, and just the the level of understanding that and the journey you must have taken to be able to put it together to me is astounding. So thank you for doing it. But, but thank you. That that really means a lot. And. Yeah, in in terms of understanding about all the in, these instruments, and yeah, it's just it's just years of being a listener as well. Because when I was a teenager, I'd just be buying albums of Chinese music and Arabic music and Indian music, and just sort of listening and and just by ear being able un, to un, be able to understand how these instruments work. And and then I mean, I was lucky enough to be taught orchestration as part of my music degree, and I was really lucky because in the place where I went, London Centre of Contemporary Music, there were teachers there who could, you know, um, teach all these kind of principles of orchestration and arrangement and things. And that was, yeah, that was totally necessary. And also later on when I was at um, SOAS, I was doing, a, even though it was Oriental music and I was also doing sort of courses in, you know, Indian and Middle East and everything, there was still a composition module there that I was doing. And, um, the fellow who taught that module, his name is Alexander Knapp, uh, he just encouraged, encouraged us to just write stuff that t- takes on all these influences, just do, do something that's yours, you know, and, and he'd listen. He's a brilliant classical musician, as well as knowing about um, Jewish music and Middle Eastern music and other things. And so he'd hear this and say, yeah, this is really interesting and really like it, just do more. You know, and and it was it was that kind of um, that was the environment in which I was able to sort of finally sort of coagulate all these ideas, and sort of realise that oh I, I, yeah this this is a, a, a possible thing, um, but yeah I mean the instrumentation changes throughout the album as well. Each sort of piece has a different orchestration. So yeah, if if it were to be played one ensemble, it'd have to be completely sort of reorchestrated and sort of reimagined for it to really work throughout a whole which is part of the reason why it's not been played live yet because it would just be sort of how um and the expensive other thing about, <laughs> that 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 too yeah i mean I, I can pull favors but there's a you know there's a limit to that yeah um, um the thing about it being sort of a work of art is it's kind of intentional because Sort of gradually, as I've sort of and sort of come to understand more about music and the reasons why I'm drawn to certain types of music, as well as other form forms of media like say books or comic comics or graphic novels or films or whatever, I've started to see them all as 
sort of sharing certain kind of ideals and kind of um, intentions. So, like for example, like a big influence on me as a, as a creative person is Alan Moore, the the comic book writer who wrote Watchmen, V for Vendetta, all of this stuff, and um, just seeing him in interviews talking about art as being this kind of um, catalyst for personal change and how as a, as an artist you it's sort of your responsibility to sort of sort of change the consciousness of the person that you're kind of communicating with and you know it's totally possible it's it's all it's it literally becomes a form of magic but being able to sort of create something which then sort of has a kind of transportative or transformative effect on another person and like um this series here was what um kind of catalyze all these ideas like Prome called Prome Promethea and it's it's this really kind of beautiful sort of psychedelic kind of comic book it's kind of like the, like a kind of a Wonder Woman-ish kind of superhero superheroine kind of character but then it's really a sort of excuse for him to talk about all these kind of esoteric ideas and it's really sort of quite um it's kind of like an appropriately sort of psychedelic section of it but it's got all the all these all this kind of like really sort of psychedelic kind of art, and the whole point of it is um, sort of the, the imagination as being kind of the shared space that we can sort of tap into as creative people, and then we can draw from that and use that sort of language to communicate. And sort of um, reading about that sort of made me sort of examine what it is that I want to do as a sort of musician and why I like. The, the the music I do, or or at least a lot of it, and and those are the things which connect lots of different types of music that you wouldn't necessarily um, sort of draw together. It's why sort of um, it's a cliche, but it's why sort of people in the sixties were drawn towards Indian classical music because it is very much a kind of um, a devotional music. It's a spiritual music that's intended to kind of um, sort of transcend ordinary consciousness, and and it's the same with a lot of the sort of the jazz I listen to, like Alice Coltrane and John Coltrane and Miles Davis and Farrah Sanders and all these people. And you start seeing all these kind of um, um, connections, and then you also under like also things like um, about looking into things about like dreams and the sort of the unconscious and sort of how our sort of minds work and like like artists like David Lynch for instance like there's a big on um, the new stuff I'm writing there's a big influence not necessarily musically but creatively by from Twin Peaks which is you know a TV show that a lot of people know but at its heart it's about the relationship between the the material world and the immaterial world where things think th things that exist and things that don't exist and how the things that don't exist can have a very serious sort of very real effect on the things that do exist and thinking about sort of uh, mythology and sort of symbolism and how um, art and music can um, represent certain things and sort of uh, induce certain states so that was all sort of stuff I was thinking about all the way through the writing of the album so um, like, uh, like there were references all the way along to things like people like William Blake um, like there are several tunes which even the titles like The Earth's Answer and Fearful Symmetry are d directly taken from William Blake in fact the title of the album itself is a kind of sort of um, compound of two two of Blake's ideas: the human image and sorry, the divine image and the human abstract. It's, so it's a combination of those two ideas, and you know, he's uh, he was another character that sort of sort of would recur in sort of my thinking about what I'm trying to do in terms of the things I create, and because he had these for at the time sort of very visionary and kind of. Um, so unusual ideas about kind of his own Christianity and he sort of reversed a lot of the sort of the religious iconography at the time in order to sort of have to sort of communicate these quite sort of visionary ideas. And same with um, 
things that I would investigate in other cultures, like, um, the, the, yeah, I've got a few things here. Like, so, so William Blake, Songs of Innocence and Experience, that was a big, that, that's where those sort of titles are taken from. And then the one that really had an effect on me was The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. So there's a bit of a, a sort of glare on that. And reading that was a big thing. But then reading things like this, which is, um, uh, the Secret of the Golden Flower, which is I sort of came across a few years ago, and it's kind of it's like a sort of Taoist sort of meditation manual, but it's all about sort of um, through meditation and through sort of certain practices, you can ascend to sort of higher states of consciousness and sort of almost become a new person. And also things like um, Joseph Campbell's sort of writing about mythology, like the whole sort of the hero's journey, and so that that played a big part in kind of shaping. Um, the album, the sort of the track listing of the album and where it sort of begins and how it sort of the arc on which it goes and where it ends, like the last track, Apotheosis, the, the title comes from his um, ideas about the hero's journey, how you're, you're sort of taken out from your ordinary sort of existence and you're sort of forced through all these kind of trials and sort of situations that change you into a sort of a new person. You take, you take on all these kind of... Um, sort of new abilities and new sort of powers as it were and then you overcome the parts of yourself that are sort of um that you want to kind of get rid of and then sort of you you become a new thing at the end of it and um and yeah there are there are sort of little sort of symbols and messages like that written into certain parts of the album that probably not many people have picked up on yet and but i know they're there like say um the very last chord you hear, the, the the cyclic thing you hear at the end of the last tune is in sort of largely a sort of C Lydian, and it kind of goes around that sort of for a good couple of minutes, and across that, um, um, you hear all the hear the woodwinds do all these different sort of melodies that kind of go across each other and all happening at kind of at once, and those are all themes from across the album that I've taken. Out and they, but they all exist in in this kind of shared space. It's kind of they've they've kind of tr transcended their own time and sort of are existing in this sort of shared moment. And then right at the end of that, it kind of resolves and it modulates up a whole step to D Lydian, which is where the album starts. The very first chord you hear is in a D Lydian. So and so it, I wanted to it me to be a bit more obvious, like with the sort of the, maybe the tune from the the beginning coming back at the end but it just didn't seem to work so it it's it's kind of there in a very subtle way but probably not in a way that it'd be really noticeable that's awesome yeah. that's a really cool way of introducing you know all the cyclic aspects of life and these mm. stories that you've brought in even in the artwork uh it's very oh i couldn't be happier with the artwork that, that that was a very late development on the album because um um the original image I wanted to use I didn't have access to because the artist wasn't available and um, uh, I had that as a sort of planned image for quite a while and then it turned out that that wasn't going to happen so uh, it just so happens that through Knife World and sort of going to all these sort of more proggy gigs around London so I knew Mark Buckingham who's big big sort of fan of unusual music and also happens to be a artist for Marvel and DC Comics and he's worked with like Neil Gaiman and all of these things and brilliant artist he was, he was the artist on Fables which is a well known sort of sort of fantasy comic that ran for quite some time it was really popular and you know sort of got to know him at sort of gigs and things and we sort of chat about comics and music and things and he said one gig well you know let me know if you ever need anything. And at the time, I still had this other image in mind for for the cover. I said, okay, maybe next time. You know, maybe, you know, uh, maybe I can ask him some other time. And then when it turned out that the original plan fell through, I just sent him sent him a really panicked message saying, you know, I know you're busy, but can you do something? Can you? Then it was, you know, I'm I'm busy, but I'll. And um, yeah, the first pencil sketch, I had to sort of make some changes to it, which felt really weird, you know, telling this really amazing comic artist, well, maybe we can make some changes, and it just felt kind of odd. But then the second sketch was perfect, and that's pretty much what, what you see on the cover. Then he turned it into like a sort of like really beautiful sort of black and white sort of art deco kind of ink 
drawing, and then it was coloured in later on, and with some adjustments. And yeah, I couldn't be happier with it because he really um, he listened through the album a few times and sort of looked at all the song titles and um, and made quite a lot of effort to integrate all of those different ideas into the kind of the mandala on the cover. It's kind of got elements from all the different tracks kind of on there. And yeah, it's, it was one of those real kind of fortuitous things because I wasn't planning that until quite late. It was about um, two months before it came out, less than two months before it came out when we actually had the artwork. It was sort of right at the last minute. Hmm. Yeah, I was lucky. to the performers and their instruments, or did they have to spend time trying to understand what you were after? Mm, well, everything was orchestrated, so no one came up with their own parts necessarily. Some of them maybe made alterations to certain things, like maybe in the piano parts, maybe they adapt certain voicings and things to be a bit more pianistic. But and um, but I mean, be because you're 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 blending different types of music you might have had someone on the Urhu playing something that might have been a more of an Arabic type melody or something like that. Did you run into any of those kinds of situations or did you really just place the instrument where it was most appropriate? Uh, oh yeah, definitely. Um, I kind of wrote for the instruments. So I made sure that the tunes that the, the say the Urhu played were you know the sort of thing you would imagine a who might play. It wasn't taking it too far from its original sort of concept, because then that in that way it can play it in its own way. Then the, the player can then add their own sort of. It's not something that's totally unfamiliar. Um, the only things that were unusual were the counting and the like, because because in that tune there's all kind, there's odd time signatures and there's hemiola and there's all kinds of stuff going on and. And that's the thing that makes it. It's not melodically that complex, but the the rhythmic placement of it is quite unusual, and definitely not the sort of thing you would sort of encounter if you're a sort of professional Ohu player, unless you're doing really sort of out there kind of sort of contemporary music. But yeah, most of the time, it's not not really a scene thing. Right. So I have some some simpler questions that are more about being a musician. Uh, doesn't mean the answers are simpler, simple though. <laughs> so first of all, um, how many instruments do you play? I kind of lose count, but it's about 15. Okay. At varying levels. Like there are some that I've been playing for a long time and some that I've just kind of picked up and learnt on the spot to put on records and things. 
It's and about it's about fifteen. And how many do you own? Uh, somewhere around that fifteen, maybe. Okay. Um, but but then so I've got the the two electric guitars, the Les Paul and the Jazzmaster, classical guitar, acoustic guitar, the sitar, the oud, the saz, acoustic bass, electric bass. I've got a Fender Six that's on there. Um, there are some that are borrowed, like the Hammer Dulcimer that I use. Um, not on the album, but it's it's all over the new Medieval Babes album, and it's been used on a couple of things. That's borrowed, um, and a couple of the other things are like the zither I borrow for. Um, there's a lap harp all over the Medieval Babes album that is borrowed, and then other than that, I lose count. It's, <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it's too much mental occupancy to. Yeah. Can you talk a to, little bit uh, about the instruments in the room with you? Oh yeah, sure. I'll um, I'll, I'll introduce you to a few of them. The newest one I have, um, which I'm which I'm really excited about, uh, is uh, this. What is that is, called? Uh, this is a Sugaru Shamisen. It's a Japanese sort of three-stringed kind of loop. That looks thing. like the um, instrument that. Um, Oh man, what's the guy's conga roll? I think his name is. He plays with Bela Fleck, and he does the Tuvan throat singing. And uh, oh right, it looks like that's the same instrument that he plays—a two or three string thing that he just strums and plays some pretty simple chords on. Mm. It might, 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 might not be the same one, but um, the shamisen came from the sanshin, which is a Chinese instrument. It traveled over to Japan a couple of hundred years ago, uh, which is slightly different. Like it's got a um, like a sort of snakeskin body mm -hmm. and um but then there are other central asian instruments that the sanshin kind of is related to like like basically the silk road is where a lot of these sort of um it was where the, a lot of these instruments travel and um and so there are so they're, they're probably sort of um relatives in mm -hmm. tuva or mongolia and various places but um the shami sen sort of came into being when the Sanshen moved over to Japan via Okinawa and it fell into the hands of musicians who played the biwa, which is um, another sort of Japanese lute instrument, which is played with this massive plectrum, um, which I, d I don't play that yet, but you know, at some, at some point. Um, and so that's why um, uh, the shamisen is played with this. Is that which flat? It, that, but yeah, this uh Okay, it's, it's interesting. A, yeah, it's called a bachi. And um and so you originally um made the skin was uh steak skin, then it changed to dog skin. Oh, this is synth synthetic. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a vegetarian, so this this is kind of kind of preferred. Yeah. And um and it's the instrument itself is used in all kinds of performance like kabuki theatre, um uh, storytelling, sort of chamber ensemble music, but um, Sugaru Shamisen sort of happened around sort of the late nineteenth century, sort of the Edo period of Japan, and um, mainly played by sort of destitute blind musicians. It's kind of like, it's almost like they're kind of blues music, and, um, and so the style was a lot more sort of aggressive, and it kind of fell out of favour for a long time, and then over the course of the twentieth century. Um, people start becoming more interested in it because it's this really sort of like cool sort of brash style. It's kind of um, like say with uh, you hold your plectrum like this, <laughs> and you um, you your plectrum travels through the string into the body of the instrument like this. I can't see. Like sort of uh, like this. Oh. Can you hear that? Uh huh. Yeah. You, yeah, you're, you're going to hear that. It's quite loud. And, um, and so it's got this kind of percussive effect. And um, it's become really popular in, with sort of young people in Japan over the past couple of decades. It's sort of become fused with other types of music. Like there are these two players called the Yoshida Brothers who are like kind of like rock stars in Japan. They sort of, they're a duo playing this. And um, I first saw it when I was about 16. Um, and there was a concert in London who, who, of the best player of this instrument, a guy called Shinichi Kanoshita. And um, it was amazing. I'd never heard any Japanese music before. It was totally my introduction to 
a lot of East Asian music. And it was just wonderful. Like the traditional pieces were great. And then he played his own compositions and it was, yeah, it was a real kind of um, sort of life-changing concert. And then I wanted to learn it, but then there was no one playing it in London at that time. And so I, so that sort of fell by the wayside. And then a few years ago, this fellow moved to London called Hibiki Chikawa, who um, is the only professional player in the UK currently. And he he was actually on the soundtrack of this film called Kubo and the Two Strings, which came out a couple of years ago. It was an um, animated sort of stop motion animation film. And he's on the soundtrack of that. And we actually did a gig together a few years ago. And so I thought, OK, yeah, I can blag some lessons of him sometime. And... Um, so it's only recently I've sort of thought, okay, right, I need to do this. And then I'm, I'm teaching him sort of like Western music theory and he's teaching me sort of shamisen. And so, so it's three strings, fretless. Um, can, you, can you give a very brief sample of what you might play on that instrument? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I remember I've only been playing this for about a month. So yeah, yeah. That's well, cool. it's all that kind of it's all that, that kind of stuff. It's great. It's it's really fun, sort of to sort of get to grips with because you've got all the sort of the wide vibrato and the sliding, and it's um very re improvisational, which is unusual for a lot of Japanese music. So it's that. That's looking forward to getting more out of that. Um, yeah, in terms of stuff that's on the album, there's this, and this is the uh, peeper that I mentioned earlier. This is Chinese. This is actually related to um, the biwa, which is the Japanese lute. I believe the, the biwa came from this, and it dates back to about sort of the 8th century. Um, it's, it's got quite a long history, and it's sort of evolved over hundreds and hundreds of years. And, um, and yeah, so it's, there's the uh, four strings, and there's your decoration on the uh -huh. thing there. And you've got um, dra dragon carved on the back. Oh, there. wow, what a beautiful That's quite, instrument. It's quite fun. Yeah, it's all it's all rosewood as well, which is lovely. And it's what's unusual about it, it's played vertically like this. And um you can see there all the all the frets are kind of raised off the body like that. Um it's played vertically and the finger style technique's really weird. It's kind of your nails are kind of going into the string like this. Mm. It's op the opposite to finger style guitar, so it's um So that's your basic sort of alternate. Um, but also the sort of really sort of characteristic technique the instrument uses is sort of really fast sort of five finger tremolo, which sort of starts with the index finger all going into the sort of strings like this. So it's all five fingers. And so again, yeah, the reason why the frets are so high is because the instrument uses all sorts of bends and sort of um, sort of decorative techniques. So it gets it's and it's really it's it's a uh, really versatile because of all the different sounds you can That's get beautiful. from the instrument. And what, it's it's lovely. What's and, on um, your what's what's around your fingers on your left hand? Oh oh oh! This is for the shamisen actually. This was the um this is the finger guard for the neck of the shamisen. Ah, uh, to uh, protect because, it. Um, yeah, because you're gliding along the neck all the time. This is just to sort of help sort of uh, reduce friction and, and yeah, so that's, protect that, your skin too. <laughs> that's that too. Yeah, I mean, um, the the shamisen strings are sort of this kind of yellowish color because they're dyed with turmeric. And I've noticed that the sort of these tiny sort of blood stains starting to appear along the string. It's good. It's oh okay. I've, I've been working hard <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, so that's great. I mean, I've, I, it's. So the peeper, this is really useful for, um, I've been able to use it in all kinds of situations. I actually played this a few years ago in a performance of a Philip Glass opera um, called Sound of a Voice, which is 
a sort of chamber opera based on sort of Japanese ghost stories. And they use this instrument because it's, you know, it's chroma- you know, tuned to a chromatic scale. It's um, got a very wide range. It's um, quite diverse kind of tonally. And um, so it's pipa, uh, flute, cello and percussion with two voices. And um, yeah, I was asked to play in that because... I was a professional player of the instrument, which is unusual in this country, and can read all the notation. And so, yeah, it's it can be used in all kinds of situations. And that's cool. And that yeah. other instrument on this one here, that's that's the that's the that's the massive one. That's called a darawan. Um, the the rawan's a family of Chinese stringed instruments that is actually older than the pipa, but. Um, it kind of disappeared for centuries and it wasn't really reconstituted until the 20th century where it was kind of redesigned and turned into sections like a string section so i also play the jong one which is the tenor one and there are smaller ones but this is the one i thought i'd show because this is like the, the massive bass one it's, ah. yeah it's it's really fun i read so I, I started kind of playing this a few years ago and my my teacher i was transcribing a tune for um acoustic guitar like a piece for this instrument because it's in dada it's a really sort of deep sound and I, I sort of transcribed it for guitar and she just said well why don't you just play it on the actual thing and she just handed me this I was like, well, you know <laughs> There you go. Why don't you do that? And the performance of that was a week later, so I had a, had a week to sort of get to grips with it and sort of perform it on for the first time. But it's got this really sort of, unlike a lot of other sort of Chinese string instruments, it's got this really sort of deep quality. To it, which is great. It's funny when you, when it's on the stand, it looks maybe as wide as an acoustic guitar, but then when it's in front of your body, a, it looks like it's bigger than your torso. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a perspective thing. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's great. It's a, yeah, it's that's really very fun. cool. London is one of the most expensive cities. It, it really is, yeah. In the world, and you live there, and you play mm. all of these strange instruments, uh, playing pretty much not mainstream music. So how does that work? Well, I have played mainstream music before, but I don't talk about that as much. Um, um, you know, making a living as a musician in London is is practically impossible. It's it, it's. It's a really difficult thing, and a lot of people either have to give up, or or just stop, or most of all they have to sort of um, bolster their income with other professions. So um, someone might just have a full-time job, maybe, or they might just sort of do like I know sort of pretty well-known musicians who during the day will do painting and decorating work, and then make weird music with the rest of their time. And it's pretty normal. And um, I mean, I'm lucky because I don't have a like a family to look after. I don't have children or anything. So um, that's something that a lot of my friends have to sort of deal with. But I've been quite lucky in that with the sort of breadth of experience I've had in terms of like st- studying classical music and sort of playing classical guitar and learning theory and things and being able to read. That's been quite an important thing is sort of the ability to sort of read music well um 
a lot of it's teaching as well. So I've been sort of a guitar teacher for about oh, just over a decade, which has its own rewards and frustrations. Um, it, can, it can be brilliant as well. Like I've got one student at the moment who's about 11 years old and he's just passed his grade three classical exam. And all he wants to talk about when I get to his class is like the anime series he's been watching. It's like, don't <laughs> start because I, I will talk to you about this. Um, and it can be really fun, but also, you know, teaching, th you know, evening courses and um, also, also the, the, even though all the instruments I play might not necessarily um, be used for mainstream music, uh, very few people are sort of playing them on any sort of professional level at least. So... I have the added advantage of being the guy that people can come to if they need someone like this. So, hence why I was asked to join Medieval Babes. Carvus was the previous instrumentalist, and then when he joined Gong, he didn't really have the time anymore. So he asked me to join. It seemed like a logical thing because, you know, play all these things. And, um, and, and yeah, so then you can get session work doing that really and like say things like the Philip Glass opera you know I was, I'm pretty much like one of two or three people in the country who could have done that because the, the combination of playing the instrument well enough and being able to read pages and pages of classical notation you know it's quite a niche skill so I'm able to sort of get by with that thing and also just being competent enough to play bass and guitar in any situation that might be useful um so I have done, gone through periods of doing other things as well. Like I was, I was actually on TV once. I was on This Morning, uh, which is like a real mainstream sort of breakfast show. And I was playing bass for a country duo, these two twin sisters. And the only reason I got the gig is because I was friends with their manager. And he saw a picture of me on Facebook playing bass in a hat. <laughs> on stage with an iPod and he's like oh wow yeah that looks really good like playing bass and hat <laughs> fancy some television work Just bring the hat yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no, I didn't didn't wear it on TV I think it was too much for TV but yeah it was and and that was a thing I got to do once and was paid to do it by the manager and you sign like a release form for them to use your image and then ITV sent me a check a couple of weeks later for the same amount so it's like just the occasional weird thing like that. Yeah. And um So it's a big hodgepodge yeah. of uh of gigs. Oh totally, yeah. I mean um just like real sort of like corporate things where you'll be sort of playing in the corner and no one in the room is listening. Yeah. But those are often the the best paid gigs you'll ever do. Um but you know, can't but then that facilitates everything else. And um and it's it's yeah. You do get by, and uh, you have a place yeah. in London. Yeah, and uh, you're doing it, so that's awesome. Yeah, I mean there are there are certain sort of um, uh, you know it's it's that thing of having to work constantly. So I've never quite it's never quite you know settled. So I always have to be kind of active. Um, but it's just um being lucky enough to not sort of know lots of people in london and sort of being able to exist in all these sort of different sort of worlds in london like so i know all the guys in the kind of the weird sort of funny music kind of proggy scene and then also knowing people who do sort of the kind of traditional sort of ethnic stuff and then sort of it's just sort of putting yourself out there and sort of if people if people know you and they like you and you do good enough work, you do good work and on time and sort of are reliable, then that kind of counts for a lot. And then, um, yeah, there's some, some, yeah, some strange things have come along as a result. Like, sort of bands paying me to go with them to, like, uh, Antwerp to shoot music videos just because they like the ideas I did on their record, you know, it's like just sort of strange things like that. But, you know, it's it, it all kind of, it's all... Yeah, it's a hodgepodge. It's all sort of very, fairly scattered and variegated, but yeah, you know, that's just just the way things are. What it takes.
I do have to get back to work. <laughs> but I do fine. I do want to talk about you have talked about the stress, anxiety and depression around mm. uh, finishing the divine abstract at least on Facebook. Mm. And yeah. then and this morning you I believe it was this morning you posted something about returning to that mm. era, you know, working through certain things in your newest composition work. Mm. Can you talk about um, just kind of that era, what led to it, and how you're working through it now? Hmm. Yeah. So I sort of came to the terms of the fact that I suffer from depression about sort of four, four years ago, four and a half years ago, or sort of around then, sort of around 2014. And... Um, before that, I'd probably gone through periods of anxiety before, but I, I knew I had friends with depression, but I could never quite relate to it. It, it never seemed sub, like something that could happen to me. It was always seemed like this thing, this like other thing. And then finally, I had to sort of, you know, be honest with myself and say, yeah, what the, the, this is what I'm going through. And, um, you know, it's a combination of things, just kind of general existential crisis and who knows, maybe a certain amount of sort of, um, you know, psychological stuff from the past, perhaps. It's just a combination of things. The stresses of being a sort of freelance musician in London and, and the sort of um, crises you go through with that and, you know, relationships and things. Do you uh, Do you get discouraged about your music as well? Like, not enough people care about it or you know why am i doing this weird esoteric thing does that get to you it oh of course okay. all, all, all the time i think that's and i think that's quite common amongst people who who do what we do you know it's um it's it's the thing you sort of have to live with is that you know maybe what you do will appeal to a certain number of people and won't necessarily have much value outside of this kind of sphere that you op operate in um, and it's a shared thing amongst a lot of friends of mine and sort of people I work with. And um, the main thing was being open and honest about it. So it got to the point where I just had to start, start talking about it, say, with friends and also be open about it on, say, things like social media. And what happens then is that you start being contacted by people who you didn't know were going through the same thing, but they'll, they'll sort of tell you privately and it sort of creates this, it kind of creates a sort of um, deeper connection with other people, I found, being sort of open in this way. So maybe, maybe that was a thing that was happening before, was that I was trying to um, be guarded. And you start realising that the, um, the version of yourself that you present to other people is often is often just that it's you know it's um it's something it's a construction and what happens when with depression is that um the construct the illusion is then sort of dissipated you don't have that image of yourself anymore it kind of destroys that image of yourself and um because you realize that uh, it's possible for you to be sort of brought down to such a level you know it can happen to you and you start um, assessing all different things about your personality and how it sort of manifests in relationships or day-to-day -day things or in life in general and so it's this thing you sort of have to face you have to it's just, you have to go through it and you have to sort of face these things often quite uncomfortable things about yourself and so it's a long period of um, being honest and open with the people around me and therapy and trying to sort of create and trying to keep myself busy with music as well and just remain active and and yeah it's a it's a real kind of liminal state almost it's a this real transitory thing where after a while you start seeing it almost as a positive because the person you become when you have to deal with all these things is so much better than the one that existed when it you be first started going through it more open more empathetic more um able to sort of express um emotions and things like that in, in language with other people and that can only help your creative work as well because if you're kind of closed off 
emotionally in your everyday life or you try and hide certain things about yourself, then that's only going to come out in what you write, I think. And um, But then I, re I also had this relationship with the music that I was writing, so the music that ended up on The Divine Abstract, because it almost became a way of um, kind of writing myself out of these states. So it's not necessarily that I'd be depressed and write depressing music as a kind of means to, you know, means of just sort of wallowing in it. It just be almost a, it's a means of escaping it and kind of trying to create an ideal state for myself to like a, a world in which I could exist that brought me back to um it's not necessarily normality but kind of beyond that sort of above above that sort of trying to aim for like a like the best aspects of myself and um and I think you can do that with music like in terms of the way like when I was talking earlier about things like magic it's kind of it's just manipulating symbols and sounds to create these things so it's it informed my approach to harmony as well in terms of like harmonic shifts was what they you have changes in harmony it's, it's about what they're doing you can create these sort of changes in color and these changes of mood and um these changes of sort of mental state through the manipulation of harmony and sort of through um you can create agitated manic states through the manipulation of rhythm like through hemiola or odd time signatures or polyrhythms you can create um sort of musical depictions of these kind of states so it's this, it's this kind of what i approached with the music on the album it sort of became this sort of um liminal thing this thing that you pass through to become a new sort of person as it were a new entity and you know so the music i'm writing currently for, for the which is going to be the next album it's kind of similar but different to the music on the divine abstract it's um it's all written in the space of about two months in terms of like the original demos it was this very sort of at first it was a very sort of manic period and then that sort of broke and then it became like a real depression like a, a really bad sort of um period of depression and um it was that same sort of period of depression that led me to finally be honest with myself and then make the music that's on the album like or finish the music that's on the album that's just come out and um and yeah so so the process of working on this music now sort of like a year and a half later it to a certain extent sort of takes you back to that time to that sort of period and that you, you kind of reminds you of the kind of the space that you're in but it kind of fit it would feel sort of creatively dishonest if i didn't do that if i didn't um sort of face face it and then sort of go through the cathartic process of turning that into something which is that sort of, yeah, that alchemical process of turning sort of like a leaden consciousness into a golden one by taking these kind of negative states and then sort of channeling it into something that um, is positive. But it's not necessarily sounds like it's coming from a place of depression because I don't necessarily want, I wouldn't necessarily want it to sound like it did, but has kind of come through it and has um, sort of expressed sort of these states as it were and you know, created something from it yeah well thank you so much for sharing all of that that's very uh insightful and vulnerable so i appreciate that thank thanks yeah, it's wonderful to talk to you about it thank you so um yeah. finally for people who want to learn more about you and your music what do you suggest they do and how can they best support you hmm well the album is on bandcamp um uh charlie k with bandcamp dot com um uh i'm also on facebook you know i've got the the musician page on facebook which i use to update about exclusively musical things i'll do twitter and instagram there's there's also the wikipedia page now mm -hmm. with, um which is which is a real kind of fun thing to have that's got that's actually fairly well sourced and it's actually it's pretty much accurate so there there is that um working on a website currently that's something that's gonna happen but the um uh, but other things that are happening soon i mean there's um there's new knife world at some point um there, there'll be the follow-up to the current album that i'm currently working on which is going to come out hopefully in about a year's time maybe a little bit more than a year's time um in 
sort of the last part of this year, there's the new Medieval Babes album, which is going to come out, um, which is which I co-arranged and played about 12 instruments on. It's like this compendium of nursery rhymes and children's songs, but done in this really sort of sort of partially beautiful and partially horrifically discordant way. And it's for what's essentially a pop classical sort of project. It's probably one of the most avant-garde things that I've ever sort of worked on. It's brilliant. And um, there's a new band that's going to kind of um, be kind of come into existence online soon called Lost Crowns. And there's an album in production with that. That's, that's a sort of almost like a super group of our little group of musicians in London. It's them. It's I'm on bass and the music is written by a fellow called Richard Larkham, who is one half of this really brilliant band called Stars in Battle Dress with his brother James and Josh from Knife World on keyboards, Rodri Marsden from Prescott on keyboards. It's this kind of real collection of um, far out musicians. And the music is totally sort of psychedelic and sort of singular and sort of strange. And I'm really looking forward to people hearing that one because it doesn't really sound like anything else. It just sounds like the sort of music for Stars in Battle Dress, but done with a full band. And um, this has all sorts of stuff happening in the next year. New My Trixie Spirit album as well, which is sort of Balinese gamelan mixed with electronica and sort of psychedelia and other stuff. And that's sort of on the go as well. So that'll hopefully be coming out next year. So there's all kinds of things. But I, I, I tend to sort of update everything on my sort of social medias and my Facebooks and everything. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for, um, for joining us. I do want to say... Um, there are two Charlie K. Woods, same spelling. <laughs> so, very, very different. Yes, yeah. extremely different music. So if you do search for Charlie K. Wood, make sure you're getting this guy and not the singer, songwriter, acoustic guitar player. I mean, <laughs> if you want to listen to that, go for it. But that's not it's, this Charlie. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's pretty much sort of diametrically opposed. Yeah, pretty so, diametrically. So good, fair distinction. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll know when you're listening to this Charlie K. Wood when you hear <laughs> all the instrumentation. But who you knows, you might prefer the other one. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, this is re it's really good. Yeah, this is much better than that instrumental stuff. <laughs> Although anyone who's gotten this far in this video is probably yes. interested in what you're doing. Experiencing slight <laughs> cognitive dissonance. Yeah, so. All right, Charlie, thank you again so much. I really appreciate you spending Thank you. Time. Real pleasure talking to you, finally. Yeah.